Welcome, and thank you very much for coming. So this is the second of four lectures I'm giving on poetry, which follow four I gave on the novel. And in addition to analysing some well-known poems, I want to show how the different literary genres lend themselves to different kinds of exploration, um, exploration essentially of the human condition. And in my last lecture, I considered ideas of remembering and remembrance in Gray's famous elegy. And tonight, I'd like to explore ideas associated with immortality, and therefore mortality, in Keats's celebrated Ode to a Nightingale. The music you've been listening to um, was by Olivier Messian, Le Réveil des Oiseaux, The Wakening of the Birds. Uh, Messian, whose life more or less covered the whole 20th century, um, was a composer who was absolutely fascinated by birdsong. And he travelled notating birdsong quite extensively in the world. And he incorporates a good deal of these transcriptions into his music. So I hope in listening you may have heard some fragments of the nightingale. So that's by way of illustrating that birdsong has been hugely important to artists in all sorts of different media. And it certainly was to Keats. So Keats, one of the most famous of the English Romantic poets, he was born on October the 31st, 1795, in London. His father was a livery stable keeper, and John Keats, hereafter I'll just call him Keats, was the oldest of four surviving children. His father died when he was eight years old, and his mother died when he was 14, of tuberculosis. His maternal grandmother found him two guardians, both London merchants, Richard Abbey and John Rowland Sandal. And when Keats was 15, Abbey decided it was time for Keats to embark on a profession. And he sent him as an apprentice to Thomas Hammond, who was a surgeon and apothecary. And Keats lodged in the attic above the surgery at 7 Church Street, Enfield, then Middlesex, until 1813. And after his apprenticeship, he registered as a medical student at Guy's Hospital. Um, a few years ago, Guy's Hospital commissioned this sculpture of Grey. And with a month of arriving at the hospital, he was accepted as a dresser, um, which is roughly equivalent of a sort of junior house surgeon today. So that was quite a rapid promotion, um, and it suggests that Keats had considerable aptitude for medicine. But he hadn't given up on writing, and he became increasingly frustrated with the time-consuming nature of his job, as I'm sure a lot of hospital doctors feel now. The earliest poem by Keats, which survives, was written in 1814 when Keats was 19. And he was already clearly set on being a poet, um, not a medic. And his brother George wrote, and I quote, that John feared that should he never be a poet, and if he was not, he would destroy himself. Well, in 1816, Keats was awarded his apothecary's license, which meant that he could practice as an apothecary, as a doctor, and as a surgeon. But before the year was out, he'd announced to his guardian that he'd resolved to give up medicine and live as a poet. And one of a growing number of friends um, who helped him in this was Leigh Hunt, who was also a friend of Byron, Shelley, and, Zwer and Wordsworth. So, Keats immediately became part of this um, very remarkable group. Hunt published The Examiner, that was the name of the journal that Hunt produced, and in May 1816, he agreed to publish Keats's sonnet, O Solitude. Keats's first volume of poetry, which is entitled simply Poems by John Pe Keats, was published in 1817. Endymion, a 4,000-line allegorical romance based on the Greek myth of the same name, appeared the following year. Two of the most influential critical magazines of the time, the Quarterly Review and Blackwood's magazine, attacked the collection and referring to the poetry of Hunt's literary circle as the Cockney School of Poetry. In Blackwood's, Keats's poem was described as nonsense and the magazine advised Keats to give up writing poetry altogether. Another critic quipped that the book might have emerged in Timbuktu, so a lot of classism and indeed racism there. 
Keats's publishers, Charles and James Ollier, apparently felt ashamed of Keats, and Keats immediately approached Taylor and Hesse on Fleet Street, and they took him up. And unlike the Ollier, they seemed really excited about Keats's work. And within a month of the publication of Poems, they were planning a new Keats volume and even paid him an advance. Taylor and Hesse were important publishers, and their list eventually included Coleridge, Hazlitt, Clare, Hogg, Carlyle, and Lamb. And I think his new publisher's confidence in him uh, was a source of great confidence uh, for Keats. In the summer of 1818, he went off on a walking tour of Northern England and Scotland, and on returning home, he committed to caring for his brother, who had also started to show signs of TB. And Tom died on December the 1st, 1818. And less than a year later, in the autumn of 1819, Keats himself was diagnosed with TB. And from February 1820, he referred to his life as a, and I quote, posthumous existence. But despite his illness, or maybe perhaps because of it, because of a greater sense of urgency, this was a period of remarkable creative activity. And in July 1820, he published his third and best known volume of poetry, Lamia, Isabella, The Eve of St. Agnes, and other poems. And in addition to those titled poems, it contains three poems often considered amongst the finest in the English language, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode on Melancholy, and the subject of tonight's lecture, Ode to a Nightingale. The book was very enthusiastically reviewed. That autumn, Keats's doctor recommended that he spend the winter in warmer climes, and he and a pa painter friend, Joseph Seven, travelled to Rome, and Keats died there on February the 23rd, 1821. He was 25 and was buried in the Protestant cemetery in Rome. Well, I've obviously been highly selective in this mini biography of Keats's life. Um, it could be argued that his two loves, particularly for Fanny Braun, whom he met while he was nursing his brother Tom, were also of great significance to him. But I've concentrated really on those aspects of his biography, which I think may explain his extraordinary capacity to render the intensity of our knowledge of mortality and thus conception of immortality, which lies very much at the heart of the ode. The early deaths of both his parents, his time living in the attic of the surgeon's shop and no doubt very aware of pain and death below him, his own experiences as a hospital doctor, Tom's death to DB and knowledge of his own approaching death, also from TB. But the ode is, of course, no means a cry of despair or hopelessness or, or youthful anger. So how should we read it? How should we approach it? Well, I think we can be guided in part by Keats's own very particular uh, conception of poetry. And he wrote, I think poetry should surprise by a fine excess and not by singularity. It should strike the reader as a wording of his own highest thoughts and appear almost a remembrance. In other words, Keats believed that the reader or listener shouldn't really be aware of the individual poetic techniques that work in the poem, but really of a, of a whole notion. And what's more, it should have a kind of familiarity that makes the, the reader or the listener feel that these are ideas or feelings or thoughts that he or she has actually had herself, but hasn't actually been able to articulate. Now, the poem was probably written in 1819, and probably composed in Hampstead, where Keats was living at the time with a friend, C.A. Brown. And Brown fam famously wrote, um, and it's very difficult to read anything about this poem without reading um, Brown's words, which I'll now quote. In the spring of 1819, a nightingale had built her nest near my house. Keats felt a tranquil and continual joy in her song. And one morning, he took his chair from the breakfast table to the grass plot under the plum tree, where he sat for two or three hours. When he came into the house, I perceived he had some scraps of paper in his hand, and these he was quietly thrusting behind the books. On inquiry, I found those scraps, four or five in number, contained his poetic feelings on the song of the nightingale. So now I think it would be good just to remind ourselves of the Nightingale's very remarkable song. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was just going to say one of the most remarkable things about Nightingale Song is it seems almost in bars because there are these pauses. Um, so I hope I hope the connection between Messian and, and that recording uh, may have be begun to emerge. Now, some people feel that Brown's account of Keats being at his house and the Nightingale and so on is all rather proprietorial, but it may give us some insight into the creative moment that was the catalyst for the poem. But we also know that on the 11th of April, 1818, Keats went for a long walk on Hampstead Heath with his good friend Coleridge, who was by then a well-established poet, some years older than Keats. And in a letter to his brother George, Keats describes how the two of them had talked about, and I quote, a thousand things, nightingales, poetry, poetical sensation, metaphysics. So I think it's unlikely that the poem came as spontaneously to Keats as Brown suggested. Um, Keats had obviously been thinking about nightingales and, and this very extraordinary song that it has for some time. So before we hear reading the poem, I just want to say a few words about the form of the ode. Um, it comes from a, a Greek form, kind of lyrical stanza, and the classical ode was actually structured in three sections, a strophe, an antistrophe, and an epode. But the English um, ode is really simply a poem that's in praise of or dedicated to a particular person um, or a particular thing that captures the poet's attention or serves as a poetic inspiration. And the earliest proponent of the ode was Edmund Spencer. Um, in, the, in the 17th century, Abraham Cowley um, was very devoted to the form. Um, a better understanding of the Pindaric form, Pindar's classical form in the 18th century, led to a bit of a revival. Um, Thomas Gray, um, whom I lectured about um, the last time I was here, wrote a number of odes very much based on the um, form, Pindar's form. And around 1800, Wordsworth revived Cowley's Pindaric for one of his finest poems, um, Imitations of Immortality. Others who wrote odes included Coleridge and Shelley. But the greatest odes of the 19th century are arguably Keats's Ode on Melancholy, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to Psyche, to Autumn, and Ode to a Nightingale. And actually after Keats, despite producing these quite exquisite poems, um, the ode form seems to have been um, very much neglected by English poets, um, with the exception of W.H. Owen, who wrote a poem which he simply entitled Ode, which satirises people's ignorance of the reality of war. And in an interview, Auden said that he had first intended to entitle the poem My Silver Age as a parody of the idea of the imperial golden age. The English ode has a very regular rhyme scheme, usually A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, D, E, which you'll see is what Keats um, adheres to in this poem. Uh, there are eight stanzas, and each stanza has ten lines. So why did Keats opt for the ode form? Well, as Beth Lau, in an interesting article, um, writes, as several critics have noted, Keats's use of the ode in 1819 grew out of his desire to discover a form that would allow more room to develop ideas um, rather than the restricting sonnet, but less freedom to range in that shapeless, it, sorry, more freedom to range in than the shapeless form um, of the sonnet, uh, sorry, of the open couplet poems. So the sonnet being too constraining um, and the open couplets maybe being too loose. Um, the English sonnet, you know, being 14 lines of iambic pentameters and having a kind of thematic progr progression in it and a kind of conclusion. Um, that obviously wasn't right for what Keats wanted to do um, in this particular poem, and so opted for the ode. And David Perkins, another very interesting critic of Keats, um, I think has demonstrated that the function of the central symbol of the nightingale holds the poem together and provides a focus for train, his train of thought. Um, so what Keats was trying to fulfil was, and I quote, to write independently and with judgment. Independently and with judgment. Now, what did he mean by this? Well, he believed in a concept that he called negative capability, which is also rather opaque. But what he meant by this was a, an ideal of a certain kind of open-mindedness uh, in terms of poetic creation. Um, he spoke of, and I quote, letting the mind be a thoroughfare for all thoughts, 
So an idea that the mind has to be passive to some degree if poetic inspiration is, is going to be allowed to work. Um, he also said he didn't want the mind, and I quote, to irritably reach after fact and reason. So this sense that, that pushing the intellect uh, wouldn't necessarily work um, in creative terms. Um, he didn't want the mind irritably reaching after fact and reason, hungering after truth, or, and I quote, always trying at it. So he often emphasised this sense that to be a poet, you really needed to be able to open your mind to the passage of ideas and association and not try to direct thoughts too much. Um, we should be able, especially if we are poets, he wrote, to be, and I quote, capable of being in uncertainties, mystery, doubts. And, and I quote, remaining content with half knowledge. And it's this idea of half knowledge or indeterminacy that I'd like to inform my commentary on the ode. But first, let's hear it read very beautifully, I think. Sorry, Alex, I've got that wrong, haven't I? Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. Read by Nicholas Shaw for the BBC. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock had I drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leithwoods had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thy happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden eyes despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee. Tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild. White hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with the easeful death, called him soft names in many amused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, 
while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. And you, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside. And now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? So the speaker begins with a declaration of his own heartache. He feels numb, as though he had taken a drug, hemlock, um, the poisonous plant which produces death by paralysis, opiate, Leith, Lethe, the river of the lower world, from which the shades, that's the spirits of the dead, drank, and thus obtained forgetfulness of the past. His addressee, thou, in the line seven, is a nightingale that he hears singing in the forest. His drowsy numbness is not a function of envy of the nightingale's happiness, but rather from sharing it too heartedly. The speaker is too happy because the nightingale singest of summer, hidden in a plot of green and shadows. The alliteration, and there's plenty of them in the poem, singest of summer, reflects the ease which the nightingale sings. In the second stanza, the speaker longs for wine, a draught of vintage, and the slow but steady oblivion it might bring fade away. The sunburnt mirth is a wonderful synesthetic expression, eliding a feeling or look, sunburnt, with an abstract noun denoting good cheer, mirth. Um, synesthesia, the idea of mixing the different senses and using one sense to evoke something that another sense would normally um, be conscious of, is used a great deal in the poem. And you might say it ties in with this idea of hearth knowledge, what exactly is sunburnt mirth. The image of the beaded bubbles winking on the brim is much admired. The alliteration of the bees catches the action of sparkling wine and suggests onomatopoeia. And the winking is suggestive of bubbles forming and bursting, rather like an eye, opening and shutting. Then in the third stanza, he declares his desire to fade far away, dissolve and quite forget. And what he wants is to leave behind the intensity of human suffering. It will dissolve, it will lose its substance and be forgotten. And what will be forgotten? Well, weariness, fret, fever, the palsy of the old. The nightingale, thou among the leaves, has never known these and has no consciousness of ageing and death. While the speaker knows that youth does not last, it dies. And of course, in his own case, this was going to be very soon. And beauty fades beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. So beauty is personified here, and her eyes are singled out, and of course it's our eyes that behold beauty. So again, there's a kind of indeterminacy which is suggestive of half-knowledge. In the fourth stanza, the, poet, uh, the speaker invites the nightingale to fly away, and he will follow. But this time, it won't, this escape won't be facilitated by wine, not charited by Bacchus and his pards, pards being leopards, but by poetry. This is what will allow the escape. And he sets up an opposition between the viewless, i.e. invisible wings of poesy, 
and the dull brain, which perplexes and retards. Rational thought, Keats believed, as I mentioned earlier, tethers the imagination to the known and familiar. But this brings no revelation if you simply hang on to the known. Um, it brings no revelation, but rather it perplexes. So here I think we have the idea of negative capability that Keats believed in, this idea for the need for open-mindedness, of letting the mind be a thoroughfare for all thoughts. Um, we should be able, as I said earlier, we should be capable of being in uncertainties, mystery and doubts, and remaining content with half-knowledge. And here, weight is associated with the mundane, the idea of being held down um, and the imagination being tethered. Um, and this, I think, we also associate with the negative states of feeling evoked, say, in the third stanza, the, the leaden eyes, the leaden eyed despairs. Again, that leaden eyes um, suggesting this idea of being weighted down. Now, already by the um, fifth line. Um, yeah, so already with the. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so already by the fifth line of this stanza, being the fourth, the speaker's caught up with the nightingale, already with thee. And the night is moonlit and starry. Again, there's personification, queen the moon and the starry fays, the starry fairies. And although there is no light, um, except when the breezes part the trees, um, in the line, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown. So there's both no light and yet some light. So again, this idea of indeterminacy. And in the fifth stanza, the speaker addresses the nightingale only by implication. There's no second present pronoun um, in this stanza, no thou, thee, thy, as elsewhere in the other verses. So here the poet is in a sense alone, um, I cannot see, but in embalmed darkness he can guess what flowers are at his feet, white hawthorn, eglantine, violets and musk rose. Um, and these lines um, echo very clearly, the Shakespearean lines from Midsummer Night's Dream, I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. But in contrast, uh, Keats's uh, stanza is very much one about presence and absence, and the poem as a whole is one very much about life and death and the indeterminacy between these things. Alone in this stanza, the speaker experiences the intense poetic epiphany, and he doesn't need to see in order to imagine or to see in his mind's eye, as the expression goes. And perhaps the reverse. I think instinctively when we want to imagine, we actually close our eyes. Um, now, much of the structure of the poem can be accounted for in terms of antithetical pairings, pain and joy, Intensity of feeling and numbness of feeling, life and death, mortality and immortality, the actual and the ideal, separation and connection. And the half-knowledge that Keats insisted on is suggested by the indeterminacy, um, what I'd like to call the space between these pairings, life, death, mortal, immortal, and so on. The speaker may be alone, but he's in embalmed darkness. Um, and this is at once an image of death, um, embalming being the pr preservation of dead bodies, um, but also perfumed. And so there's a wonderful double meaning in the, embalm in the embalmed there. And this then leads to the contemplation of the attractions of death, of which the speaker tells in stanza six. I've been half in love with easeful death. Now, there's a hint of irony here, as the nightingale sang in the first stanza, you'll remember, in full-throated ease. Um, so ease is being used, on the one hand, to celebrate the facility of the nightingale in its song, um, but also the easeful death, um, which is the temptation of death. 
that the speaker feels at this moment. The moment of ecstasy, listening to the artless exquisiteness of the nightingale's song, strikes him as an ideal moment at which to die, to cease with no pain while thou art pouring forth thy soul. And the speaker would die in the knowledge that the nightingale's song would not cease, even if he were no longer there to hear it. And there's ambiguity or indeterminacy here about the word still in the penultimate line of the sixth stanza. Still wouldst thou sing. Now the still could either denote a temporal continuity, you'll still be singing, or physical lack of movement, still will you sing. The first suggests immortality. The second suggests death. The stillness of death. The lack of movement of death. So the idea of the speaker's mortality, in contrast to the nightingale, is introduced and then expanded upon in the famous first two lines of the seventh stanza. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, no hungry generations tread thee down. Now these two lines um, have been commented on at enormous length uh, by the critics. Um, and one interesting um, insight is offered by Andrew Kappel in an article on the immortality of the natural. And he writes, these lines um, initiated the vexed issue of the bird's immortality, which is still, despite much discussion, a stu stumbling block to satisfactory interpretation of the stanza. Several critics speculate that the immortality is only relative, that Keats' assertion refers not to an individual bird, but to the species. So the individual nightingale may die, but the species continues. Now, the obviously obvious objection with that is that one of the things Keats is trying to do is to set up an important opposition between the poet's mortality and the immortality of the nightingale. So if it's a question of species, that doesn't really seem to work, because after all, man is also a species <laughs> um, that continues on. So that doesn't seem altogether convincing. Um, there's also a school of thought that sees it as, as symbolic and argues that the bird is actually the symbol of lyric poetry. Um, but that's then to elide the poet and the poet's work, endeavour, and the nightingales. So again, that doesn't set up the key distinction that the poem is emphasising, which is this difference between the poet's knowledge of his mortality and the song of the nightingale, which he describes as immortal. And what Kappel uh, suggests, and I think this is very convincing, is that what really matters is that the poet is conscious of his mortality, that we all live with the consciousness that life will not go on forever. But the voice of the poet speculates that the bird belongs to the natural world as opposed to the human world, and the bird therefore isn't conscious of its own mortality, and that it can sing joyously, and every day is a new day, uh, every day is a day in which to enjoy its capacity to sing, whereas the poet knows that his life will come to an end, and he knows that the nightingale's life will come to an end, but he knows the nightingale doesn't know that or supposes the nightingale doesn't know that. Now, I'd like to suggest a further possibility um, about these two lines. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, no hungry generations tread thee down. Now, poetry is constantly being rewritten. Poets borrow from the dead. One could even suggest that poets um, are the magpies that pinch the poetry of other poets and take it back to their nests where they rework it into their own poetry. And that seems to me to be suggested by this idea, no hungry generations tread thee down. Keats knew that other poets would take fragments from his poetry and muck it about, do new things with it. Whereas the Nightingale song remains the pure song. And in, in the poem, Keats speculates that this same song has been heard all the way back to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. So as I was thinking about this, I thought, really, I ought to know more about ornithology. Um, is there any chance that this song has remained the same over time? You know, is the Nightingale's song likely to have changed? Anyway, um, I decided that there must be someone I could appeal to um, for an explanation about this. So I found off an email to a very eminent Oxford zoologist who 
is a specialist in ornithology. He said, very sorry to bother you, this will come rather out of the blue. I'm writing a lecture about Keats, and I really need to know your views on whether or not the Nightingale's song will have changed. And within a very short space of time, an email bounced back, and Christopher Perrins from the Department of Zoology, um, Professor Christopher Perrins, wrote, I'm afraid that this is not a very helpful reply, but I suppose no one really knows the answer to your question. My guess is that the answer is that we are hearing the same song that Keats heard. However, without good quality recordings, I do not see how anyone could answer your question. My guess would be, this is the second time he's been prepared to guess, which I like in an academic. My guess would be that it had not changed. Small local differences have been noticed between birds of the same species which sing in different habitats. This includes those which sing in urban areas being slightly different from those in rural habitats. But I know none that relate to nightingales. Christopher Perrins. So... Well, there he said that he's prepared to guess that it is the same, um, and I simply wrote back thanking him and saying this is very much the answer that I hoped for, and no doubt the answer Keats would have hoped for too. So could it be that another interpretation of these lines is to do with this sense in which poetry is constantly being broken and reshaped, that hungry generations, that we take the dead poet's work and we rework it um, to an extraordinary degree, whereas... Listening to the Nightingale's song, the poet might have been very aware that it had this immortality, that that same song wouldn't be mucked about by other people. It would just continue, um, in that sense, immortally. Now, the voice he hears singing in line 53 has always been heard by emperors and clowns and by the biblical homesick Ruth. As I mentioned, the corn is alien because Ruth was not an Israelite, um, but a Moabitess gleaning in the barley fields of Judah. So that's from Ruth 2, verses 1 to 2. So the poet speculates that Ruth, in exile, may have heard the same song. And in the eighth and final stanza, um, the word forlorn tolls like a bell to restore the speaker from his preoccupation with the nightingale back to himself. My soul self in lines reminiscent of Gray's elegy that we explored a few weeks ago. This means, of course, that he is alone, but soul is a homophone for soul, S-O-U-L. And in the sixth stanza, it was the nightingales, thou art pouring forth thy soul. So these wonderful echoes throughout the poem. The fancy, that is, imagination, cannot sustain the speaker's vision, the plaintive anthem that is the nightingale's song now fades, and tis buried deep in the next valley glades. And the buried, picking up perhaps on the idea of embalmment from the fifth stanza, both referring to death. Now the verb fade, fade has occurred three times and it of course denotes that movement from presence to absence which mirrors that of life and death. The half-knowledge, the indeterminacy, are intimately bound up with the idea of fading, moving from one state to another state, from light to shade, from day to night, from life to death, and so on. But imperceptibly undermining, uh, the, this imperceptibly undermining the all-embracing antithetical pairs. The bird's anthem fades, not the bird. In fact, there's an important distinction to be made between the speaker's half-knowledge and the bird's ontological status, ontology in the sense of the philosophical study of of existence, of reality, um, of categories of being. And as Andrew Kappel points out uh, in the article I just mentioned, and I quote, the trajectory of the bird's withdrawal at the end of the poem is an indication that its ontological status as a natural being is being maintained to the end. As it withdraws, it moves from one natural setting to another, never venturing outside nature and retreating ever more deeply into the natural world. Thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows and over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. The use of hyphens here, hillside, um, and the more original valley glades, again suggests half-knowledge as a hillside the same as the side of a hill, are the valley glades the same as the glades of the valley. The poem ends, of course, with two questions. 
uh, was what the speaker has described, a vision or a waking dream. Do I wake or sleep? And here too, of course, we have the ultimate indeterminacy of the poem being, in a sense, summed up in these lines. So it concludes, really, with indeterminacy. So it would be a great irony if Keats's um, extraordinary exploration of our knowledge of, immort our knowledge of mortality and our conception of immortality had faded out of human consciousness. So what of its posterity? Um, in relation to the Nightingale's immortal song, um, which we heard earlier, how did his poetry fare? Well, if you type Ode to a Nightingale into Google, you get about 1,250,000 results within a few seconds. Keats's influence was strong in the 19th century, and his poetry resonates into the 20th, and I'm thinking of poets like Wallace Stevens and T.S. Eliot in particular, and I'll be lecturing on T.S. Eliot next year. So the hungry generations did tread him down to some degree, um, Poets using the work of the dead poets is, is at once an act of, of recognition of, of their um, brilliance, um, but it is also a, a changing of things, uh, which stands in contrast to the Nightingale song. As I mentioned earlier, Keats died at the age of 25, and he was buried in the Protestant cemetery in Rome. And two of his friends added the following epitaph. This grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who, on his deathbed, in the bitterness of his heart, at the malicious power of his enemies, desired these words to be engraven on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. 24 February, 1821. And there's no name on the gravestone. Now... They added these lines because they wanted to register the deep, their deep disappointment with the really cruel critical reception that Keats had had to suffer. And Hunt, uh, Lee Hunt, blamed his death to some degree on the courtly reviews, derisive attack um, of Endymion, one of his early poems. Um, Byron, um, in a particularly foul mood, um, retaliated with the following lines in his narrative poem, Don Juan. "'Tis strange the mind that very fiery particle should let itself be snuffed out by an article." Well, Keats was snuffed out in his youth, um, but this poem has remained remarkably popular. And to finish, I think I'd just like to point out some of the features of the poem which I think make it so very effective. It's fantastically good at creating a mood at the start of the poem, the thudding alliteratives of D and P and M evoke the dull ache that the poet's describing. And in the second half of the stanza, on the other hand, the light assonantal, that's the repetition of vowel sounds, um, are created by words like light and dryad. And there's a sensual, lingering quality in the assonant sounds beech and green and ease when the poet's evoking the joyousness of the nightingale's song. And in terms of pace, I think one can compare the brisk and ecstatic vitality of the second stanza, which skips along at considerable speed, with the heaviness and monotony of the third stanza. There's a marked concentration of sense impressions and frequent use of synesthesia, as I said earlier. In the first stanza, for example, the plot where the bird sings is itself melodious, um, a very interesting idea of a melodious plot. Um, you know, it's a transferred epithet, in effect. It's the, it's the song of, of the nightingale, which is melodious, but it's being used to describe the plot where the bird is singing. And the song contains summer. The visual evokes the aural, and the aural the visual. In stanza two, the taste of wine is evoked by means of colour, action, song, and sensation. That's very heady synesthesia. And in stanza five, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. The suggestion that the incense could be seen emphasizes the kind of materiality and headiness of the perfume. Uh, this idea, incense hanging upon the boughs. I mean, in incense is invisible. Incense doesn't have any... Um, we can't see it. 
Um, and it's the processes and movement of the poet's mind that are so central to the ode, and the personal eye is very much foregrounded. And it was this intensely personal quality of the poem, married to its extraordinary musical effects, that um, F. Scott Fitzgerald um, very much admired. Um, these are brought out very well in a recording um, of the poem that I would like you to hear. Um, it's only part of the poem. One of the strange things about the recording is that he never finished it. He just sort of drifts off at some point, um, some way from the end of the poem. Scott Fitzgerald, this is the great Gatsby, uh, Scott Fitzgerald was a great admirer of his poem, as I say, and the title of one of his most famous novels, Tender is the Night, comes, of course, from Keats's Ode. So um, we'll finish listening to Scott Fitzgerald um, in this extraordinarily moving and incomplete rendering. Scott Fitzgerald died the same year as this recording. Um, he was only 44, and he also died of TB, like Keats. So we'll finish listening to Scott Fitzgerald, and then I'll um, hang around at the front if anyone has any questions, but we do have to be out of here promptly by 7 o'clock. So thank you, and here is the reading. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as if of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drain. A moment since the leafy word had sunk. Tis not from envy thine happy lot that being too happy in thine happiness that thou light-winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green, and shadows numberless singest of summer and full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long hour in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green dance, and Provencal song and sunbeam mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south. Full of the trail, the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim, and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and with thee fade into the forest dim, fade far away, and fast forget what thou on earth hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan. Where palsy shakes a few last sad gray hairs, where youth grows dumb and fever thin and dies, and new love cannot live beyond tomorrow, where beauty cannot live. Thank you. <laughs>